So, uh, <clears throat> we have been looking at the worship. I took a break because I wanted to look at Easter. Um, so we did take a break, and I uh, want to get back to this. A few things, uh, we did this several years ago. Uh, this is from Brother William Hill, and uh, I just have to tell you, sometimes pastor just needs a little bit of someone to be able to give him a guideline because it's worrisome at times building. And so I thank God that we can utilize resources for other folks. And so Brother Brother Hill now has gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, he pastored in Iowa. It was uh, a huge uh, 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 blessing for me when I was in Bible school. Uh, he came and did holiness convention there for gospel. And this was powerful. If you ever heard, he was funny. He could make you laugh and then make you cry the next moment. But just through the love of the Lord, he was very gifted. And so uh, I'm not on any type of a schedule tonight. Uh, I'm just simply here to, to uh, maneuver through our lesson. And where we stop, we stop. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking to get the whole lesson. I'm looking to be able to talk and tonight. Uh, be able to just gain truth from God's word. So a call to worship. So if we worship God, we have to learn to worship Him two ways. I'm reflecting back where we were. We must worship Him in spirit and truth. And the truth is in the word of God. It has to come from obeying. And, uh, and, and, and we talked about where does God live? God lives in our what? He lives in our worship. The words that we said. Uh, he inhabits the praise of his people. And so uh, if we're going to uh, 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 worship God, uh, we're going to find that he lives in that place of worship to him. He doesn't just inhabit a church. He inhabits us. We're the temple. And he inhabits our praise. And so tonight, we're going to be looking about at the act of worship. So here we go. I'll give you the blanks. We're going to have lots of verses. So uh, be ready to go. If you don't have the verse looked up in your Bible, uh, read it from the paper. I'll give you the words. I'm not, if someone makes a mistake or stumbles over words, I do it every service. So welcome to my world. We're just here to glorify God and to learn tonight. Amen. And I appreciate the worship that's already been on this evening. It's hard to worship when our eyes are on the world. When our eyes are on the world. Or, or on other people. I know the blanks kind of continue, but the word is people. On making money. Being successful. Or on ourselves ourselves to worship in spirit and in truth we have to take our eyes off everything else and focus on Jesus our Lord taking our eyes off of everything listen it's easy to get distracted how many of us have been distracted ever before in our life? Uh, you know, there are folks that they have good intentions to come to church, but they're distracted. That's why they don't make it. There are <coughs> folks that have good intentions on worshiping God, but they're distracted. Distractions are the enemy's best tools to keep us from doing and being what God wants us to be. Distracted. There's all kinds of things that can distract us. The next paragraph, worship is an action we take. Worship is an action we take. It's something we do. So action and do are the words there. And living a, a lifestyle of worship, there are many ways to demonstrate. D E M O N. S-T-R-A-T-E. -E, demonstrate our worship. We're going to talk about those ways to demonstrate our worship in a few moments. And you know what? 
it's going to be mind altering for us as we see these ways that we worship God. Because we have a mindset that our worship is by raising our hands and lifting our voice and saying particular words that, that are in a realm of worship that we know. But worship is way beyond that. It's an act. And we're going to talk about those acts of worship. And living a lifestyle of worship, there are many ways to demonstrate our worship. Worship is expressing, expressing, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-I-N-G, -S -S expressing our love and our adoration to God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. How often do you say, I love you? Can we ever say it enough? <coughs> No, we can't. Not to those around about us. Not to our Heavenly Father. We can't tell God we love Him enough. We'll never exhaust that. When we realize how much God loves us, we will love Him all the more. He knows our faults. F-A-U-L-T-S. Our failures. F-A-I-L-U-R-E-S. And yet He loves us still. We are His children. He loves us so much that He gave His Son to die for us. How many has ever looked at your spouse and been grateful that they still love you in spite of who you are? Still love you when they see you at your very worst. And God knows you even better than your spouse does. And yet He loves you. How amazing is that? That God loves you in spite of who you are and what you've done and, 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 and your best efforts and even failing. Any of you ever look at yourself and say, why can't I learn to overcome that? When will I ever learn? But God loves you in spite of all that. And He sent His Son to die for you. Someone read 1 John 4, verse 9, 10, and 19. If you don't know the words, it's all right. I'll, I'll give you the words. And what this was manifested the love of God towards us because they, that He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, if I remember correctly, but that He loved us. Correct. Very good. But that He Loved us. But that he loved us. Go ahead, brother. Okay. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We love him because he first loved us. We love him. Why? Because he first demonstrated love toward us. His love is already there. We don't have to earn it. Praise God. Do you hear that tonight? His love's already there. We don't have to earn it. Those of you that are parents, you notice around Christmas how your children can really begin to warm up to you. You notice that maybe when they've done something wrong, they know how to warm up to you. Don't laugh at them. You did it too. <laughs> because we want to earn love, right? We want to earn recognition. We want to earn a good place. But there is nothing tonight that we can do to earn the love of God because He's already given it to us. Come on. So, I've said this hundreds of times before. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more and there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. God doesn't love the sinner any less than He loves you. We just found His love. And because we found His love, we've acknowledged it and we display it back. The sinner just hasn't found it yet. But God loves them the same way He does us. And we don't have to do anything to bribe Him to love us. 
Someone read Matthew 10, verse 19, for the verse number 31. Are not two pearls sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to fall the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Here you have therefore, you are all more right, more valuable than any treasures. Ye are of more value. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. I came out of my house this morning and it's breaking light, right? We have this great big pine tree in front of our house and it's thick. And there's these birds that love to live in there. And I come out and they just chip, 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 all over the place. That was a nice kind of sound, actually. It reminded me of springs on the way. But you know, I couldn't see them, but God knew every sparrow. God sees every sparrow that takes off in flight. God sees every, every bird. Do you know, I had an amazing thing happen to me. Ron, you live in Lawton? You know, as you're coming around the bend, as you're going to the auction, you go around the bend, coming kind of down, there's that big yellow house there. Uh, Al Palmer's daughter and some of all lives there. I was coming home from work last week, and uh, I was driving right by their house, and I looked up in the sky and saw an eagle. A bald eagle. It was beautiful. So we have eagles in Lawton. How about that? I'll take that. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. You know, God already knew about my bird being there before I did. And you know, that's insignificant, really, because the Word of God says He knows all about those birds. But we're more valuable than them. He loves us, He knows all about us. It's insignificant how many hairs are on your head or how many less hairs I have than you. It's really insignificant. It doesn't matter. But God has them all numbered. And if God is concerned about those things, how much more is he concerned about everything? He loves us. I love this right here. Listen to this next paragraph. You are more you are valuable, God. If he had a refrigerator, R-E-F-R-I-G-E-R-A-T-O-R, R-E-F, R-I-G. E R A T O R. If he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, W A L L E T. If he had a wallet, your picture would be found in it. But he doesn't need a picture, or he doesn't need, he doesn't need a refrigerator or a wallet. He has your picture embedded in his mind. He knows your name. He knows where you live. He loves you. Can you love him back? That's what worship is. It's an act. He knows where you live. He knows where 1400 North Second Street is and Likens. Folks may think it's mixed up up here in Likens. He knows it's in Lawton. He knows it's the back street. He knows exactly where we live, the Seville family. And he loves the dad of the family, the mom of the family, and the, the girls of the family. He loves them all. He knows where that little corner is and Hickory Corners, where that beautiful valley is, Mother Craig. He knows where you live. Brother Doug, he even knows his way back to Shippen Amber. He knows exactly where you are. He knows. He loves you. Someone read there that next verse, 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 26 to 29. You can't get it. It'll be good. So the first blank is foolish. The second blank is weak. Foolish and weak.
our foolishness and our stupidity and all of that he chooses us so that he would get the glory he teaches he trains we know we are nothing 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 without him someone read first corinthians 1 verse 30 31 there but of him are ye in christ jesus who of god has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the lord amen if we are going to glory let us glory in god amen uh, let's glorify god because he takes those weak things those foolish things that's who we are we're weak in ourselves when we have foolish ideas at times but he takes those things and he teaches and he trains and he molds and he makes and he shapes so that we can give him the glory and the honor and the praise. Do you know why God saves us? Because he wants us to worship him. Amen. Amen. He wants it to be an act in spirit and in truth. He wants our acts to bring worship to him. God must get all the glory as our lifestyle, our very beings, Begin to worship Him. Begin to worship. W-O-R-S-H-I-P. Worship Him. And please, please Him. In everything that we do, we will experience different emotions. Sometimes we cry and cry and cry. This is an act of worship. I want you to know tonight that every one of us here, you big he-men, there are times that you cry. Amen. Do you know that that is an act of worship? We think that it's all the hallelujahs and the praise of the Lord and the smiles and the excitement. And yes, that is worship. But worship is also our crying. Someone read there. Uh, Psalms 34, verse number 18. The Lord is high unto them that are of a broken heart, and say with such as be of a contrary spirit. The Bible says that God is nigh to them that have a broken heart, and say with such as be of a contrite, C O N T R I T E, spirit, a broken, a broken spirit. And so, our worship tonight, remember the alabaster box was broken. It was worship. God loves when things are broken and worship to Him. So when we cry, our spirits are broken. It is worship to Him. How long has it been? And I know that we like the moments of raising our hands. And we like the moments of praise the Lord. But let me ask you this. How long has it been since tears have ran down your face as you worship God? God loves broken worship. It is worship to Him when we bring our brokenness to Him. Listen to what Psalms 147.3 says. He healeth the brokenhearted and He bindeth up their wounds. It's worship to Him. He draws nigh to us when we're broken. Someone read Isaiah 66 too. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, P-O-O-R, and of a contrite spirit, and tremble at that. Okay, that's fine. I missed a line anyhow. And tremble at my works. Then moving on. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. He'll be a refuge for the oppressed. O P P R E S S E D. Oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwells in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Amen. Let me go ahead and read this next paragraph, then we'll talk. Even in our seemingly lowest state of body, mind, or emotion, 
even in our seemingly lowest state of body, mind, or emotion, our tears are an offering to God. We can say, I hurt so much, but I still love you. I hurt so much, but I still love you, Lord. Take my broken vessel and let me bring on to you. You know, we're so busy all the time wanting to be healed. We're so busy all the time wanting life to be good. And life is good. But there are moments where we are broken. So what do we say? We're broken because of situations. Those situations can vary due to life circumstances, our age, our current status, wherever we are. They, they, they can just vary. So there's no need for me tonight to try to label something. Because we've all been there in different seasons, different places where, where we really feel broken. And so to be able to say, God, take my broken. I think depression too. A lot of people get depressed. But even in your depression, you know, God can lift us up. But that can also be a form of brokenness that we can say, God, here I am. Let this bring glory to you. Listen, some of the times of David's life were some of the most difficult times, but he wrote some of the most amazing worship to God. Paul was in prison, but wrote anointed letters. <coughs> John was on the Isle of Patmos, left there to be drove crazy. The, the rushing of, of, of the, 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 the water hitting the rocks and just <clears throat> being left there to be driven insane. But yet there God visited him and he was open to God. Uh, I, I need to tell you that, that those are the places where God even wants our worship and God's not expecting everything to be perfect to have our worship. God wants our worship in the middle of all those things that are going wrong to be able to say, God, somewhere in this, may my life bring glory to you. Amen. When my mother died, we buried her on Friday. Next Saturday morning, son came in the window behind uh, Ed, and I was, this happened so rapidly, so quickly, that before I came to I knew the sun was up, and I heard deep in my spirit, uh, no evil shall befall me. And I get on my knees, and I just wail before God, and I, I mourn before the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, it did take, it, it helped. But it's a continual process. Amen. I continue to mourn. And I continue for the immediate future. But it's sort of like a bubble. Uh, but it would come back again. She died in May. We moved to Reading in September. And that first Christmas was extremely difficult for me. Because we had no place to go. And uh, again, I would mourn again uh, before him. But I also like to, my brother talked about depression there. Uh, I follow the scripture. He is the glory and the lifter of my head. And what that means is, is that it says this poor man cried unto him. So what that means about the glory and the lifter of our head, that we will allow, in the Bible days, if a man was struck and was begging, he would never look uh, his giver in the eye. But if someone came and picked his chin up, made him look into his eyes, the person that lifted up his chin was now taking full responsibility for that person's life. And he was taking him to his home and to his uh, vineyard or wherever he had. And he would use him and employ him to care for him. So the Lord is the glory and the lifter of our head. I would never minimize someone who has clinical depression. Never want to presume to, uh, to to presume upon things from them, but I, with whatever else they're seeking uh, avenues of help, I would strongly encourage them to cry out to Jesus. Amen. Wow.
because he is the glory of the I believe depression did a lot of suicide. Don't you? I mean, you call it broken heart. I mean, they are broken heart too, but I mean, and, and depression is a sickness. I mean, it's a real sickness. I mean, it's a real sickness. There, there are some. And I had a good friend of mine that was a very good ball player back in my day, and about five years ago, he got into cocaine. He just couldn't beat cocaine. He couldn't get a job. And he had a beautiful wife, and he lived in Halifax. And his mom was talking to him in the morning, and she didn't sound right, so he called out back to his, uh, his brother told him to go check on him. By the time his brother got up to his house in Halifax, up behind the Halifax Hotel, he lived on the hill. There he, <clears throat> he couldn't find him in the house, went out in the garden, and everything. Hung himself. There are several things. There are, there are situational times where we can feel depressed because of our situation. There are, there are some folks that their body can truly get out of uh, their chemistry, get out of Well, I know he had a very bad cocaine problem. But and he couldn't beat this drug problem. And he couldn't have been, and therefore he couldn't get a job. And no one would hire him because he went back to drug test. And his wife was on his crap. And, and he didn't even understand, you know. He had two children, two nice children, and he had a beautiful wife. His wife was working, and he's sitting home snorting coke. And, and he just couldn't beat, the, beat it. And it got him down, and got him, I mean, I'm blaming the devil. But, but the devil the, got him down that bad that he couldn't. And it ain't, you know what I mean? It ain't Jimmy. I mean, it's Jimmy Carroll's who it was, and his dad had a septic thing. Carroll's septic had known him first. There can also be that of oppression and possession. So it, 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 it takes really knowing what the presence, you, we, we have to walk in the spirit. We have to know, we can never take for granted where someone is. We need to pray and we need to have spiritual insight if we're truly going to help people. And we need to be spent and given. That means prayer, that means fasting. And there should be our life lived in such a way where there's an acuteness of knowing where people are spiritually. What, so, what, 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 what do you mean about what, what's your fasting? Fasting? And I tried that one time, no food, no day, and I made it from morning till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I had a drink. I mean, I got well, that week. I, mean, I got delirious. I think our bodies need water. I think. If, if you know that you have health conditions as well, you need to be wise. And so fasting as far as... Um, Are you saying like cut out certain food or cut out certain... Well, I believe food. I believe food and I believe there can be certain things. You're saying something you love and food-wise, just don't eat it? Well, I think, there are, or how do you do that? I think there are different types of fasting. We'll talk about that one day. Oh. But, 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 but let, me, let me get back to this. We're talking about in our lives, all of us can go through difficult times. I'm talking to believers. I don't believe believers can be possessed. So I believe that, that the enemy can fight against believers, uh, can discourage, uh, uh, distract, depress. And so, uh, but in the middle of our, but there can be flat out difficult times in life. Uh, I, I can tell you, I was thinking today of this, that even when my brother died, it probably took me six months to a year to get back on my feet. I mean, it just threw me for a loop. I mean, emotionally, it, I, I was strong spiritually, but, but physically, it was very difficult for me. And so learning that in those moments that we worship God, I did not like it. I thought it was an injustice. I still feel it's an injustice. But I can feel that all I want but God's plan and God's ways. And, and I'm not going to get into all the circumstances of that. But what God was looking for for me is my worship. And it wasn't that things had to be right for me to worship. God was looking for me to worship in my current condition. And sometimes we spend our life trying to change things and get to a status where we think that worship is just right for God. God's not looking for a certain type of status or a certain type of place. God is looking for us right here, right now in the present to worship Him. And it doesn't matter if things are good or bad. God wants our worship. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
And I found that there were moments where I had to come into church and just worship. And if no one else knew about it, and even tonight I'm telling you, I, I probably had one of the worst days I had in months today. Just terrible patient mode. Just everything going right. And just flat out exhausted, just to be honest. But I come into church tonight, and I was ready for church, but I needed to forget about the message and the Bible study, and I just had a quiet place of prayer and just get around the sanctuary and just worship because God wanted to hear my worship in my current condition, even if I was tired. That is worship tonight, that God takes us where we are, and we know that God loves us, and we worship God just because He is. I can tell you it changed me and it helped me. Even as other believers come in and conversation. Yes, we all have terrible days. It's just that I was busy. It was overwhelming. And when you're an hour and a half behind <coughs> drawing people's blood, they don't like waiting on you. And they're free to let you know that. <laughs> 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 and so you put on a smile and you try to... But it's just a worship. That's my job. That's my job. Everybody has a thing. I'm good. Yes. Sir. You, you carry a little Bible with you when you're facing your weight and hand one of those. <laughs> if it were, if it were, uh, yeah. I, trust me, I give them more work I can Sometimes the devil will you to focus on your unworthiness. Absolutely. Your failure. Uh, Joseph talked about uh, that Christians should not focus on their successes or on their failures. But the focus should be on the worthiness of Christ. Amen. To receive worship. Uh, I've seen people already when the communion trays have been passed around. I'll see, I've seen this already at times where a Christian will refuse uh, the other. The scripture says, let a man examine himself, and it also says, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. The examination is not to keep us from God, but to cause us to go closer to God. Remember the scripture says that we enter into the throne room boldly crying, mercy, mercy, mercy. Who needs mercy? The guilty need mercy. So uh, our worship is not based on our record of success or failure. It's based on his worthiness and no matter what the circumstances, it's hard sometimes. When our hearts are breaking, when we're confused, when God is doing something that we're allowing something to happen, it's hard for us to understand. I think if we will pry the pump and just begin to say, God is good, I worship you, that eventually it'll start to flow through. Amen. I, I, I love how you just express that. Um, that we all are guilty, we need God's mercy. And God is not looking for us in our life to have everything together. You know, we we as adults can come up and we can say, well, I envisioned myself to be here when I was younger, or maybe we fall short of our own goals or what, what we wanted, or maybe we're a little dissatisfied. With, but God's not looking at that. God looks at us and he sees how we've been faithful with what we've been given. That's what God looks at. God, and God is looking for us not to waste even our moments of difficulty or brokenness. God wants those moments where He comes by, where we worship Him. He visits and He binds the brokenhearted. He encourages us. He strengthens us. That is what really helps us in the long run. Let me go ahead and read it here in Isaiah 61, verse number 1. I'll read the scripture and give you the words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me. What we need in the middle of our, our, our brokenness or our, 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 our weariness or our low state of body, mind, emotion, uh, He wants to anoint us to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, so anointed me to preach the good tidings, and sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim liberty, liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Let me read this next verse, because I really want to get to this this next uh, uh, paragraph, and then we'll close. 
Then in Luke, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal, H-E-A-L, the brokenhearted, preach. to preach deliverance, D-E-L-I-V-E-R, B-E-R-A-N-C-E, -E -E, to the captive, and the recovery of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And this is the last paragraph I really want to focus on this evening. The, Bible, or the, the note says here, God can use our brokenness to minister to someone else. Amen. We may not feel completely healed ourselves when He leads us to reach out. To reach out to someone else. We feel their pain. We cry with them. We offer them the littlest ray of hope that we find. We have worshipped God. We have worshipped God. God's not looking for everything to be perfect. God is looking for us to worship. And in the middle of our worship and our brokenness, we minister to others. Brother Craig, there's probably not a week that goes by that I'm not at a bedside of someone who is very sick in the hospital or who is dying, but to be able to be brought into their fragile moment where they are worshiping God. And Brother David, I think here I am as the chaplain, and my goal and my responsibility is to be and to be present and to minister to them. But I walk away being ministered to, Brother Doug. Do you know why? Because in the middle of their brokenness, they are worshiping God. And God is taking their worship and ministering to me. Are they fixed? Do they have it together? Absolutely not. But because they know how to worship in brokenness, their broken worship ministers to me. How many of us have ever seen someone singing a song and as they sing that song, those words are so powerful that they're broken and the, the Holy Spirit begins to work and move through them and the Holy Ghost begins to speak through them and now all of a sudden because they're broken and they're worshiping, it ministers to us. Or someone shares their testimony of where they're at or what they're going through and you see God working in them and it ministers. David ministered to us as we saw his life. Talk about a man who's broken. He ministers to us. Talk about Joseph, a man who's broken, but he ministers to us. Talk about Paul uh, of the New Testament and, and, and the greatness of that. He's a broken man, but he ministers to us. You see, real worship is when we worship God in our broken spirit, our broken body, our broken emotions, whatever it is, not looking to fix. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, a pet peeve. I'm tired of Christians trying to fix it. You can't fix it. Leave it alone. Only God can fix it. So who are you trying to fix everybody's situation? Would you allow the Holy Ghost to move through your brokenness? That's where he ministers the most. Where it's broken. So stop trying to fix it. Really. Amen. And stop thinking that you're a Christian, everything needs to be perfect. It's not going to be. Not going to be. Until we get to the other side. Now, I'm not talking about faith here and seeing God move mountains and heal bodies. We need to do that. But let God do it. Amen. And until He does it, we're going to worship Him. Because sometimes that's the most magnificent worship is in our brokenness. And it ministers to others. I'm going to finish with this verse. Oh Lord, my strength and my fortress, and my refuge in the day of my affliction. When we worship when He is our strength. How many have ever found before that things change all the way around when we worship God? 
I know my anger, I get real angry at somebody, like, and I pray about it, about a time or later, I calm down. Amen. Worship changes things. What, what did you say that is there? Oh, oh, my, oh Lord, my worship. My strength. My strength and my fortress. My strength and my fortress. My refuge in the day of my affliction. Sister Holly, that last song you sung, more of these, the last. Back up to the piano, let's sing that closing. I'm wrapping up.